for the audio or you can even watch back Giving players all the props or put them on blast We don't give no hot takes, only talk facts We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line can hold it down shout out to my man sammy got it off the ground and to all the listeners tuned in right now got debates analysis and speculation this is sports talk for the new generation you know where to find us got a reputation sick podcast your number one sports destination giving all our devotion riding high on this wave of emotion going all out yeah because this is our time no way to listen to the sick podcast with tony maradero 55 seconds left in the penalty a minute and 27 seconds left in regulation time boston four montreal three 
Lafleur coming out rather gingerly on the right side. He gives it into Lemaire back to Lafleur. Oh! The sickest Montreal Canadiens podcast. <laughs> You're in the fall. Sports entertainment like no other. Rejoint, on lui fait perdre la rondelle une passe devant. Et c'est bon. Ce sera la victoire des Canadiens. Stanley pour les Canadiens. Le back troisième de l'histoire. You found the dogs. John, you found the dogs. He found the dogs. And all together, they worked a young team to the top. And now, a 24th Stanley Cup banner will hang from the rafters of the famous forum in Montreal. The Canadians win the Stanley Cup. Brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. La Vida TV. Embrace your true nature. And Playground. Your premier gaming destination. It's gonna be sick. Marinaro on this Thursday, April 18. The Montreal Canadian season is over, but like we promised you, the sick podcast with Tony Marinaro will continue, albeit for very abbreviated editions of the sick podcast compared to what you've had throughout the entire hockey season, where the podcast would probably be on average about an hour, but a little bit is a little bit better than nothing, is it not? We're going to bring you quality. We'll continue to bring you quality, a lot of it. That, I promise you, we'll get to tonight's guest in just a second, not before I talk to you about energy transportation. Group, Playground, and Labitta TV. Those are our partners and our sponsors, and we thank them very much. The Montreal Canadiens players had a chance to clean out their lockers yesterday. They had their exit meetings with Gorton Hughes and maybe even Martin St. Louis. And joining us to talk about it is a former NHL player who's been through that process before. As a matter of fact, he is TSN hockey analyst Frank Corrado. How are you? I'm good. I, I got to say, it's a little bit of a bold move for you having me on a Montreal Canadiens podcast. Not that I'm not in tune with the team. I've been at the Bell Center a lot this year. I've been following the team a lot, calling games in the booth, doing some panels. But like, take a look over my shoulder here. I got one yeah. piece of Leafs memorabilia. Let me move my head. Another piece go. of Leafs memorabilia. Like if I go this way, I got like, yeah. are you sure? You sure you want me on the podcast? Um, don't worry about it. Here in Montreal, we have a very, very good memory of the Toronto Maple Leafs. They're the team that blew a 3-1 series lead versus the Canadians several years ago. Because I, have that. They, I, I remember that as well. well. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Hey, Frankie, it's uh, it's so much fun to have you on, and I appreciate it. I have been watching your work, I can tell you that, and I've appreciated your work. And I'm not one, just one of those guys who says it, because to tell you the truth, if I didn't like what you were doing, I wouldn't get you on. So I do, and you're on, and I'm grateful, and I thank you. For those who didn't have a chance to follow your entire career, I'd love to bring up your hockey DB so they can see actually the wealth of experience that you had at different levels of hockey. But you were a former fifth round pick, 150th overall, the 2011 NHL entry draft. That's the year that the Boston Bruins actually beat the Vancouver Canucks in the Stanley Cup final. And you were a draft pick of the Vancouver Canucks. So you're with Vancouver. You went from Vancouver to the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, you were up and down from the National Hockey League to the American Hockey League, back to the National Hockey League, back to the AHL, the National Hockey League with the Pittsburgh Penguins, their American Hockey League affiliate, of course, with the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins as well. And from there to the Toronto Marlies, the Belleville Senators, and then a little bit in Sweden and in the KHL as well to finish off your hockey career in 2021-2022. And you love the game so much, you decided to pursue it in terms of the media. And it's great to have you. The transition has been amazing for you once again. I think you're very good at what you do. You're a hockey analyst for TSN. You've had a chance to work many Montreal Canadiens games for TSN television. The players were clearing out their lockers yesterday. What I'd love to do with you is... Actually, first, get your thoughts on the Canadian season, and then we'll play some of the clips to get your reaction. Your overall thoughts on the season, what you liked, and maybe what you liked a little bit less. Well, I would say there's there's a lot of optimism around the group, and there's a lot of individual stories to like more than you know the, the team as a whole. Listen, we know where the team finished. We know they're going to get a high draft pick. That's probably not the worst thing for this group moving forward. Um, but you know, it's if you start looking at the progression of Nick Suzuki, like that's you know comes to the forefront. It's like that's a legit first line center in the NHL every day of the week. 
um, how far Yuri Slavkovsky came from the start of the year to the finish uh, of the season where he scores his 20th goal um, and gets his 50th point in game 82 at the Bell Center. Uh, I thought both goaltenders took big strides this year, like Sam Montembo really earned that extension. Um, and, you know, Caden Primo, we saw his game kind of um, become a little more consistent after the three goalie rotation uh, finished. I think the decor took another step as far as the second year players. They're not rookies anymore, and um, they did a good job. I think Marty St. Louis has really gotten his group to buy into um, you know a certain level of effort and compete every night. Um, you know, being around the arena, you know, after morning skate and, and talking to people, um, it just seems like they've they've really bought into the the culture that they're trying to build. Like they're really trying to build something special and you can kind of get that sense uh, when you're around the group. So uh, I think that's really cool. Like there's just, there's all these individual stories that you hope, um, you know, next year or the year after um, kind of all come together at the same time. And you hope there's, there, there's enough there to, to make a group that's sustainably good. You know, like year after year, this team shows up and we're not talking about playoffs. We're talking about how far in the playoffs. And, um, you know, it, I think it still is in the infancy of that. But there's a lot of a, a lot of really nice stories uh, around the group. Like, you know, for a team that finished that low in the standings, I don't think you'll find that many positive stories, um, or, you know, w when a team finishes that low in the standings. So I think that's uh, a lot of reason to be optimistic about where this group is going. Speaking of the group and the locker room, Cole Caulfield touched on it. Let's hear from him. Sometimes we're too close. I think uh, it's not a bad thing to have. I think uh, you probably don't see this around any too many NHL locker rooms. It's, it's such a tight group. But, um, <clears throat> again, like we're all doing the same thing every day, grinding together. So it's been a lot of fun. And um, next year is just another opportunity to do that. Frank, as a guy who's played on several teams in several different leagues and has been in several locker rooms, I know players often talk about the group. They often talk about the locker room. How challenging is it to have a close room, a tight group? Is it something that's easy to accomplish or difficult, and why? Well, it's easier when the team is good. Like when when the team is good, and you know everyone thinks that the the team has an opportunity to win. Whatever issues you know may arise, everyone just kind of parks it because there's a, a larger task at hand, and everyone understands the uh, the gravity of that situation. When the team's not very good, you you can and you, you can lose that sense of purpose as a group. And this group never let that happen. And I think that goes back to, you know, the team buying into what Marty St. Louis is selling them as far as building something here and everyone being a big part of it. So um, it is, you know, the, you, you play with a lot of great players over your career. You play with a lot of great people. Um, but, you know, the, the more memorable groups tend to be on teams where you have success. Um, but, you know, for, for Cole Caulfield to kind of talk about how close they are, I think that just goes to show you how much these guys really want to lean on each other and want to uh, kind of get their their group over the finish line as far as the rebuild and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, that'll happen at some point. But it is impressive that, you know, they, they, they managed to kind of stick together and, um, you know, kind of show that positivity all season long. What are some of the things that we'd have to look out for that should be a concern that could end up hindering a very good locker room. What are some of the signs that you look at? See, it's, it's hard from the outside. You're, you're, you're going to have a hard time seeing that from the outside, but I, I would say like, you know, if, and this is today's NHL, right? Someone throws a big hit and all of a sudden everyone comes in because it's like, they got to do the fight or they got to do the, the, the tough guy routine. But like, if you don't see that, like that, that would be a little bit of a red flag because everyone does that. Like every single team, if someone gets hit or if it's a dirty hit, it's like we're coming in and we're going to let you know that's not OK. Like I've, I've seen the Habs come to players defense many, many times this season. Um, you know, another thing it's like, do you do you kind of do you skate hard for every loose puck? Here's here's actually here's a good one. So if, if your teammate makes a mistake on the ice, how willing are you? to make sure he doesn't look bad. Like how willing are you to, to not let that mistake cost the team? I think that's, that's usually the, the telltale sign of, of, you know, how much people are really bought in and how much they really care. Um, and, and like I said, like effort has never been an issue for this team. Compete has never been an issue for this team. It's funny. Like, you know, we'll, 
We'll be at, at the Bell Center. Or we'll be on, on the road calling games and the uh, the visiting team or the the, uh, the other team's broadcast team will come up and talk to us, myself and Brian Mudrick. And, and they'll, you know, it seems like this team's a scrappy team. Like this team, it doesn't seem like they're an easy out. That is the sentiment we get every single time yeah. we talk to the opposing team's broadcast crew. So I think that's a that's a really nice compliment that the, the kind of the word is out that that's what the team is is all about. You know, Frankie, I saw something in the last game of the season for the Canadians that has not received any press whatsoever. And uh, I actually even forgot about it over the past couple of days. And I'm just actually thinking about it right now. Last game of the season, it's a nothing game for the Montreal Canadiens. They've been eliminated from a playoff spot for some time. And I think they're in overtime versus Detroit. I, I think it happened at the end, near the end of the overtime and not near the end of the third period. Nick Suzuki goes down with like two seconds left on the clock and blocks a shot Mm -hmm. when his off season and his summer is starting like five minutes after that, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and, and he's, he's, he's got himself a new home and he's done renovations and, and uh, he and his girlfriend want to probably want to take off on a trip. And the last thing you want to do is get, hurt when you know you may or may not go to the worlds i think he said that he's thinking about it doesn't look like he will go but you know so many guys on so many teams that have been eliminated would step out of the way of that shot and say you know what my summer's starting in five minutes what a message when the captain of your team the best player on your team sacrifices his body in a season in which they're not making the playoffs. I thought that was amazing. Yeah, you know what? We we noticed that on the broadcast as well. And uh, we made note to... It was not something that had to be done, but it was something that had to be done for him. You know what I mean? Like, he's just one of those guys where there's certain things that are non-negotiables in his game. And a lot of those things are are the things like that, like blocking a shot, like putting in that extra effort to get to a puck first or uh, being really strong on your stick to win a puck battle. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not surprised. And, and that's there's a reason why he's such a young captain and a, and a quite successful captain at that. He's a very mature person. He's a very mature player, um, you know, for the, the limited kind of exposure I've had to him uh, this season in the locker room always been impressed with how well-spoken he is Um, and just, you know, one of those never too high, never too low kind of personalities, which I I really admire because it it is easy to get lost in in that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, I think that that also goes back to as much as the coach wants to instill work ethic and habits and all that kind of stuff, it means more when it comes from your best players. It has, you know, forever. And, you know, like I, I like you, you put up my hockey DB page there. I was fortunate to play for the Penguins for a very brief time. I was around the team more than I played as a, as a healthy scratch extra, whatever you want to call it. Um, but, you know, getting to see Crosby firsthand um, in that situation, it was like he was the hardest working player, not only the best player, um, which, which, you know, everyone else has to follow suit. And that's when the the real accountability comes into place. When you know your best players kind of put you know put it on the line, everyone else has to, or else you're just you're just not going to be there. Um, so I, I think that's um, very admirable of him, and I'm not surprised because you know it's just one of those things for him. It's just a non negotiable. We were talking about Nick Suzuki. Let's hear from him. I think we have Nick Suzuki. Do we I have could say Nick a lot Suzuki? about both of them? You know the growth that they showed this year. Um, you know, Cole he obviously wanted probably to score more goals, but you know the way he was able to play defense, um, you know, make plays, not just be so locked in on scoring. I think it definitely made him a lot better of a player, and you know he's always going to be that threat to score. And, and you know the the growth he's shown this year has been great. It's helped our line a lot. And, and same goes with Slav. I think he had a lot of confidence coming in. Uh, kind of, you know, stumbled out of the gate once Kirby got hurt. Was just trying to find a line, and you know, once the three of us got put together, I think he really took off. Gained a lot of confidence. Just, you know, it, he's an amazing player. He just needed that, uh, you know, boost of confidence to take his game to the next level. No surprise, Nick Suzuki talking about his uh, line mates more so than he's talking about himself. What did you uh, take out of what he had to say about Cole Caulfield and your Slavkowski? 
Yeah, I think that the Caulfield thing, like a, a lot of people made a lot of the fact that, you know, it wasn't a 40 goal season for him. And I think that's what a lot of people kind of expected considering the the pace he had been scoring at previously. You know, you look back at last year, he's over a 16% shooter last year. Uh, Cole Caulfield is, I think for his career, he's about 12 and a half. Um, and it was a, it was a strong finish to the year. And, you know, if he's going to have 27 goals in a, in a so-called down year where his shooting percentage is down, I think he'll take that. And what comes with that is we got to see Cole Caulfield become more of a playmaker. We got to see him play more of a complete game because he had to, because you have to bring something to the table. Like if you're not going to score, you do have to do uh, something else that helps the team. And um, I, I was, it was interesting watching Caulfield play the last little while where um, it didn't feel like he had to force feed shots at the net. Like it didn't, it never felt like it was frantic for him. He had the most shots on the team um, and he's, you know, he's up there as far as shots on goal in the NHL. I don't know the exact number, but I know going into the last game, I think he was at 310 shots. Um, and, you know, it just, it never felt like it was overly forced. And I think as the season went on, like earlier on in the year, uh, we just we weren't seeing the chances at five on five, you know, on the power play or at three on three. We could see him get a little more time and space to to get the shot off. As the season went on, he found ways to create that separation. So there's so there's some progression there. And then you know the the last couple weeks of the season, he he started filling the net a little bit more. Um, and I actually had I, I don't know if you heard on the broadcast, but I. I had a chance to talk to him one morning. I asked him about his stick and the the lie, the curve, the flex, all that stuff. And I asked, like, you know, during during a stretch like he went through, do you ever consider tweaking it or trying something else? Like, nope, I'm comfortable. Um, I may try a different lie in the summer, but it's just it's going to happen. And sure enough, you know, it, it did happen for him. And um, yeah, I just think his his game become became more well rounded because it had yeah. to. You know, the talk of making him a more complete player. Uh, obviously, becoming a more complete player helps everyone. But in Caulfield's case, I think it's even extra important. Uh, let me elaborate. Like most scorers, he's streaky. He can go zero for 11 and then score seven goals in four games. If you're a union dimensional goal scorer and you don't know how to do a lot of those other things, when you're zero for 11 you need to be able to do something else. Hence the importance of making him a more complete player is even more important for a guy like Caulfield, who's a streaky scorer. Now, if Caulfield was scoring 41 per season and a goal every other game, that's a really good level of consistency for players like Ovechkin and uh, Austin Matthews, who have scored 50 or 60. And did it pain, did it pain you to say Austin Matthews? Did it pain? Did, did uh, a little part of you die saying that? No, it, it didn't pain me at all because I'm very happy that Austin has good regular seasons. I hope it continues <laughs> to be that way for him. You That's see, nice. in the city of champions, which is Montreal, we don't look yeah. at regular seasons all that much. Mind you, here I am talking about a team that finished fifth last in the standings, but you know what I'm getting. All kidding aside, I know what you're saying. It's all good. Yeah. I I think it's important. I think it was important for Caulfield, and I think he did become a better player. I think the Canadians are trying to find ways with him where he can minimize those slumps or actually make them uh, slumps of lesser games. You talked about Slavkowski. Let's hear from him because he mentioned areas where he needed to improve and he improved. What areas were those? Here's your eye, Slavkowski. I was just to see the, the growth and the uh... That the maybe start wasn't great, but then it uh, got together and got better. And just to see that it works and that I can, I can play. <laughs> you know, you improved your game in many ways this season. Where do you think you improved most personally? I mean, just to yeah, I would say just be better on the puck. Like I don't know, making better plays. Like felt like I had more time, so I could be more type of. Also, type of player I want to be, and that I try my things and feel like that's an important thing. But also, like I don't know, on the defensive side, I feel like I improved a lot just because, like playing on top lines every night, you have to be more responsible and everything. So I that part of the game too. I'm just so many things I could name right now. I feel like because yeah, it wasn't great start, and there was yeah, it's good because I didn't start great, so. I could improve and it can yeah, only get better. 
He didn't start great, but he can only improve and get better, which he did. He learned how to be a more complete player. He learned how to play more of a 200-foot game. He learned how to play against some of the best players in the league. He learned to be more patient on the puck. He learned to have more poise. How impressed are you that he was able to learn all of this less than 120 games into the National Hockey League at an age of now 20 years old and like three weeks or whatever it is? Very impressed. And, you know, it almost doesn't do it justice to, to just use like narrative buzzwords. Like you really, if you really dive into the specifics of how much better he got and how he did it, like for me, start with the foundation. Okay. So the foundation for me is his skating. Last year, prior to him, you know, getting hurt, he would fall a lot. He would get hit a lot. Uh, he just, you know, for a really strong guy, it never really looked like he was that stable. And what a complete 180 this year was because, you know, he was the one initiating a lot of the body contact. He was the one knocking a lot of people down. I, I hardly ever saw him down on the ice. Like his, his, his base, his foundation uh, really improved a lot. So then, you know, once that Frankie, pardon me, pardon me, do yeah. you think it could have been his stamina a year ago or lack thereof that if he's out of gas, it's easier to fall? Or do you think it was a coordination issue? Do you think it was hitting the wall in a, in a you know, for a uh, just playing in the best league in the world? We know he got hurt after 39 games or so. Yeah. What do you attribute those things to that falling down on the ice as often as he did? Where do you think that came from? Well, it's, okay. So I'll tell you just from experience, like I was not built the way he was. I was built six foot one, 195 pounds. I would get thrown around a little bit in the NHL. Like you get to the NHL, those guys are coming to take your lunch money. They are just, they're big, they're thick, and they've been doing it for a long time. And, you know, I, I saw the video of him last year at training camp, basically breaking the wheels off the bike. Like he was really, really strong. Like he's powerful, but skating, and, you know, being on that base, that skating base is different than, you know, like sheer strength on a bike or in a weight room. So it, it is different. Sometimes it does take a little bit of an adjustment with how you train or even just just getting used to it, like getting used to, you know, the, the stronger players in the NHL. Now, with that being said, like once that kind of writes the ship. Now you feel like you have a lot more confidence in the other areas of your game. And he just, it, it seemed like every week, every month, you know, he would just show us something a little bit different. Like there was a point in the season where um, he, he really became like, I, I thought he would skate with the puck way more. Like I, I thought he would get the puck on his stick and instead of looking uh, first instinct to move it, it was, let me move my feet. And, and I thought he did a good job of that. Then in the offensive zone, I thought he was more uh, ready and willing to shoot. And he was working with the shot doctor, they call him, for, for a long time this year to work yeah. on that confidence. Yeah. And, then, and then the passing, you know, like I, I think he's uh, – correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like he's a shooter more than he was a passer, um, you know, be before he, he came to the league. I, I know, like you could go either way on that. But I think the, yeah. the passing became a little more instinctual after where it was like – he kind of he would he would almost get a puck in the offensive zone and double clutch it or hold on hesitate a little bit. It was like he kind of he kind of knew what he wanted to do a little more before yeah. he he got the puck. And then the other thing, like this th this was the one that that really impressed me, where you know I think at times maybe he was just willing to defer as far as problem solving on the ice. You know, like hey, I'll just kind of like chip it off the boards. And it was like no, now I'm going to stick handle my way out of this problem. Now I'm going to move my feet. I'm going to make a fake like. Uh, it just all these things kind of kept growing at the same time for him and you know give him a lot of credit because you know th that's him like he's he's putting in the work that doesn't just happen you know like people think progression just ha oh it just it just happened for him it happened for him because he worked his ass off you know it happened for him because yeah. he, he's obsessed Big with the time. game like that's you know that's that's really what it comes down to so uh, a lot of very encouraging things and now you know the the management group has to always kind of wrestle with this do we want players going to the minors or do we want them around Marty St. Louis and Alex Burroughs and Trevor Litowski and Stefan Robida every single day? Because for, for Slavkovsky, he was, and we, we, we saw how that paid off and that paid off in a big way. So, you know, moving forward, they'll always kind of have that, you know, if you want to call it an X factor, but you know, they'll always have that to look back to and, and be like, listen, we, we, our development model may be a little bit different because we're going to have players around some coachings uh, and some coaches that, that understand what these guys have been through.
Frank, I'm aware of your reality. Uh, recently, you had twins. Uh, and so there's uh, a lot of long nights and it is pretty late. So it's bedtime for the twins. I, I just want to play one more clip very, very quickly. Yeah, Alex Newhook, get your final thoughts on Newhook before we say goodbye. It was, uh, you know, I think, an encouraging season. Um, exciting. You know, it was, it was good to be here. I really enjoyed uh you know, the guys on the team, um, coaching staff, you know, everyone kind of involved with the organization here. Um, you know, really welcome in with, with open arms. And um, I can't say enough about that, coming in and feeling welcome right away. Um, it just says a lot about a group. And um, had a lot of fun with this group this year. Uh, yeah, I think it's it's really uh, encouraging and exciting group, like I was saying. Um, we got a lot of key pieces here. We play the right way. Uh, I think we're, we're really close to becoming a pretty dangerous team in this league and, and uh, you know, a top team in this league. And just uh, looking forward to taking that next step next year. Alex Newhook was acquired for two draft picks. The deal wasn't unanimous. A lot of Canadians fans said, well, why don't you hold on to those picks and you could have shopped them at the draft instead of pulling the trigger on this move before the draft. We saw a player that's been, that played wing this season that played center. We also saw a player who picked up four more points than he did a year ago with Colorado in 27 less games. It was a very good year for Alex Nook. Unfortunately, uh, he missed 27 games due to injury. But I'll just ask you this before I let you go. From what you saw from Nook playing center and wing, do you think he's a better centerman or winger? And where do you see him slotted in and why? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I, I like him as a centerman. Uh, I just, I, I like the, like, there was a couple goals this year where he kind of makes it happen by getting to the middle of the ice. Like, I think if you keep him onto the outside, you're, you're almost limiting what he can do. Like, I, I, I really liked his, um, you know, because he has the speed, like he's pretty evasive. Um, I, I think he can slow things down a little bit, which is, which is good because you can make plays at a, at a little bit of a slower speed. Like, I just thought, you know, for him, the last little while when he was playing center with Armia and when they were playing with Joshua Waugh, you know, and of course he gets hurt, but that line was playing really well. And then Brendan Gallagher steps in and he plays really well. Like, I think that goes to show you that that centerman can really drive that line and he can really drive his wingers. And, um, you know, I, I understand maybe the the hesitation around the trade, but uh, you pointed out the stats. And anytime you trade for a player like that, where you think there's a little more under the hood um, and then he shows that. It's obviously, you know, it's obviously a great sign. And I just, you know, if you're trying to build something here where you want to be fast, you want to be kind of like an up-tempo team in other teams' faces, like he fits the bill for a lot of those things. Um, and I just, you know, I, I liked what he brought to the table in, in a lot of different ways. It, it, it wasn't just one thing. Like, it's not just super obvious. It's not just speed. Yeah, speed. That's great. There's a lot of fast players that don't do anything with the puck. Um, but, you know, I, I just think he he brought something to that group. And now I'm excited to see what he does next year. If, if you know, there's, there's some newer, you know, some new players around him, like Kirby Doc is going to be back. Like, it'll be... It'll be interesting to see how things get slotted next year, but um, he held up his end of the bargain, and of course, he'll have to continue that moving forward. But I, I liked what he brought to the table in the middle of the ice, and I thought he made his wingers better. Frank, I love what you brought to the table to TSN Hockey this year. I especially love what you brought to the table tonight on the Sick Podcast. Thanks very much for being a part of it, the first of what I hope is going to be many. All right. Thanks for having me, Tony. All right. I'd love to have this guy as a regular next season. I'm going to be very honest with you. Now, I wasn't able to have him for all that long, but I knew his reality is that he's had twins and they got to go to bed. So I took what I can get. Um, so I, I want to I want to touch on something, okay? Because one of the key topics that we brought up yesterday with Craig Button was a clip of when Jeff Gordon was asked, who are his core players that he thinks can be part of a Stanley Cup winning team in Montreal. And a lot of the media, for whatever reason, hasn't really talked about this all that much. I think there's so many things to think about in his answer. But one of the players he brought up, Frankie Corrado just brought up, and Frankie said something about two or three minutes ago about, I think... 
when it comes to development, do you want to have your players develop at the National Hockey League level under Marty St. Louis or not? And of course, asking the question is answering it. Who's going to say no? But at the same time, I think it all depends who it is. And in saying that, I remember something that we were told about Slavkovsky when we asked Kent Hughes, why do you insist on keeping him here and why do you think he's going to develop more at the National Hockey League level in Montreal than he would in Laval? We'll get to that in a minute. But in the meantime, let's get to that question asked to Jeff Gordon yesterday. Opponents do you believe you currently have within your core that you would consider to be part of the core of a potential Stanley Cup winner down the line? Oh. Oh, that's tough. The players are listening to this too, right? Right? Um... <laughs> Well, I mean, I think, listen, like we said at the beginning of the year, it's it's about growth and who's getting better and who's at their ceiling and who still can, who still has more to go. Um, and I, th I still think we have, like you see Nick, um, Suzuki's season is, uh, maybe some people thought he was where he was last year and that's going to be where it was, but he had a great year, he showed. Uh, his ability to be a number one center for the franchise, I think. Um, so that's huge for us and a, and a huge piece, right? So um, you see Slavkovsky, you know, maybe 12 months ago in this room, people are maybe looking at us like we didn't know what we're doing, right? So, but now it's a year later and he looks like he's going to be a really good player, right? So, um, and Sam Montembeau's emergence as, as, uh, as a really good goalie. So there's a lot of good things happening in this organization. Um, to put a number on, uh, you know, wh the core, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that we have people in this organization that are going to be our core that haven't identified that yet, haven't, haven't had the opportunity, that may not even be with us yet. So it's hard to say that. Um, but to answer, like, I, there's a lot of good players here. There's a lot of good young players coming. Um, it's really exciting. I think the first part of your question was, how do you feel about the opportunity to take this to kind of the next level? We're excited, and uh, you know it's a big job. This is the part right now where it's probably going to be the hardest, where we're identifying who's who's going to be part of that, and uh, as we move forward, and uh, you know it's really exciting. But it's also the fun part of putting a team together, and uh, hopefully, uh, you know we're right in what we're. It's it's a great question by Eric Engels, who asks, "Who are your core players that you think will be part?" Of? I believe one of them is a first-pairing defenseman that could lock 25 to 30 minutes per game that can shut down the opposition's best line. I believe another one is a number one centerman. I believe another one is a power play specialist. I believe another one is possibly like a 35-plus goal scorer. One of them might even be a shutdown player. Anyway, next time Pierre is on, we'll make him elaborate on the seven-player profile. But I, I once again, without making a huge thing out of it, but I don't want to make it sound small either because I think it's significant. Yes, Jeff Gordon talked about the players who grew this year, but he was specifically asked, who are the players of your core that you can see on a Stanley Cup winning team? He's a very thought -out gen well thought out gentleman. He thought about it. He actually even said the players are listening to this, right? So he was okay saying what he said. And sometimes general managers, VP of hockey ops, coaches, they take advantage of press conferences to say certain things that they either want to get off their chest or they want to pass a message. Some of you are probably saying, oh, no, it doesn't work that way. In this business, it does. Believe me when I tell you that. We have been, you know, it's happened. The members of the media have been asked. It's happened. The members of media have been approached. It's, it's happened that they've received a text message from somebody at some level in sport saying, hey, if you get a chance... Ask me this because there's a certain message they want to get out. I mean, some communications teams have asked some members of the media in the past, hey, if you get a chance, can you please ask about this? Because there's a certain message they want to get out. Gordon says, oh, the players are listening to this, right? And he brings up Suzuki and Slavkovsky, which I'm not surprised whatsoever. But he brings up Montembeau, and I'm shocked that he brought up Montembeau. For the last year or so, all we've been hearing from people that know Jacob Fowler really well or have seen Jacob Fowler play a lot is that one day when the Montreal Canadiens are going to be a Stanley Cup contender, it's going to be Jacob Fowler that's going to take them there. 
We never heard it was Montembeau that was going to take them there. Kent Hughes went out of his way yesterday to say that even Montembeau, even though he made strides, they still want him to work on his game because they believe he has other levels. And so it sounds like they think his ceiling is pretty high. <clears throat> Jeff Gordon didn't bring up Cole Caulfield's name when asked about the core players that he believes will be part of a Stanley Cup winning team. That doesn't mean that Caulfield's not going to be on a team that's going to go to the Stanley Cup or not going to be on a Canadian team that will go far. As a matter of fact, I'm sure he will be. And I'm sure the Canadians will make it to a Stanley Cup final. When? I don't know. Let me just guess five years. But I believe they will. And I believe they're going to be very competitive for a very long time. I don't know if they're going to make the playoffs next year. They'll be in the mix. So being in the mix means that you can possibly make it on the last night of the season. Or you could possibly get eliminated on the last night or with two games left in the season. They're going to be in that mix. And two years from now, I'm ready to bet the house they're going to be in the playoffs. And once they get in, I'm ready to bet the house that they'll make the playoffs for at least six consecutive years after that to be conservative because I want to give you a number that's even more than that. <clears throat> but I find it interesting that Caulfield's name wasn't included for whatever reason that was. I woke up this morning to a notification on my phone on YouTube from someone saying, oh, Tony, give me a break, saying that Jeff Gordon hates Cole Caulfield. Hey, please. I say a lot, but don't put words in my mouth. I never said something like that. Never. Didn't say that. As a matter of fact, I know they like him very much. We're one year removed from them giving Cole Caulfield an eight-year contract at $7.85 million per year. When they gave it to him, they gave it to him with the thought in mind that he's going to be part of the core. But I'm wondering if, even though he had the best goal-scoring season of his career and the best point total of his career, I'm wondering if he was left out to get him going a little bit more, to motivate him a little bit more, to stimulate him a little bit more? Or is it because even though he's a very good player, they have Suzuki and Slavkowski as untouchables and Caulfield not quite there yet? Don't forget, about a week ago, Maxim Lapierre joined us on the SICK podcast. And Max said, Tony, I like Caulfield, but he's not an untouchable. And I like Caulfield, but if they go to the Stanley Cup, I don't think he's going to be in their top three players or their top four. Snake Boisvert had said that, and Max said, I don't know who Snake Boisvert is, but I had a chance to see his clip of him saying it on social media, and I agree with him. Earlier this evening, I was on GC on, on TVA Sports, I'm on that television show Monday to Friday at around 5.30 p.m. Eastern. And we were talking about this very same subject. And, of course, there's a lot to di dissect there. But I said to GC, he's got Cole Caulfield as part of his core. And I said, look, if Caulfield plays to his potential and with consistency, for sure he's going to be part of that core for me. Like, for me, if you ask me that question, who's part of your core that you could see on a Stanley Cup winning team, the first three names I would say would be Suzuki, Slavkowski, and Gouli. Suzuki is your number one centerman. Slavkowski is your number one power forward. You drafted him first overall, an incredibly complete player who I think is going to be even better in the playoffs one day than he is in the regular season. And Caden Gouli, I can already visualize him jumping over the boards and stepping on the ice Every time the other team's top line or top player steps on the ice, I could already visualize him being that horse playing the 28 minutes per game, night in, night out in the playoffs. Now, if Caulfield plays to his potential that everyone thinks and everyone sees of a possible 40-goal scorer and minimizes the slumps, he plays with a little bit more consistency. There's no doubt that he's going to enter into that equation of the core players. If Lane Hudson plays to the potential that he has and plays the way he's played at all these levels prior to the National Hockey League and plays in the National Hockey League the way he finished the season with the two games that he played versus Detroit, Lane Hudson's going to be part of that group as well. But I just thought it was an interesting answer. And I said to J.C., 
earlier tonight on television, I said, JC, let me ask you something. And it's just for talking, just to have fun here a little bit. And I said to him, I said, if the Ottawa Senators would call you and they would offer you Brady Kachuk and ask for your Slavkovsky, would you make the deal? He said, no, I would not. I said, okay. Now, if when the Ottawa Senators called you and they offered you Brady Kachuk, if they asked for Cole Caulfield, would you make the deal? He said, yeah, that's a deal I would make. So once again, you take a look at the whole touchable, untouchable. Now, once again, maybe there is no touchable. Maybe there is no untouchable, all depending on what someone's going to offer you. Someone once said there's no untouchable player in the world. It all depends on what the offer is. I thought the answer was interesting. I don't think it was... I didn't. I don't think Gordon just forgot. I think he said the names that he said for a reason, and I think other names will enter that equation. And Hughes added, "Sometimes we don't have the answer just yet." But he said, "Take a look at Slavkowski," and he said Slavkowski um, started slow, got a little bit better, had a setback or two, boom, then took off. He said, "At one point, we expect him to go sideways again." before getting better again. So as far as other players are concerned, we have to see how they deal with adversity when things aren't going their way. And that gives us cues as to who core players can be. It's very interesting. It almost sounds like when players are struggling, how down do they get on themselves and what do they do to find solutions? And if they don't get too down on themselves and they are able to find those solutions and right away, those are the players that could become core players. In ending on Slavkowski, Jeff Gordon said something. They said, you know, a year ago, a lot of people didn't think we knew what we were doing with Slavkowski because he was going through a tough time. One year later, Slavkowski has developed really well. It looks like he's going to be a really good player. And I got to tell you, Kent Hughes about a year ago gave the analogy that when asked about Uri Slavkowski and the pace of the game going very fast for him and he was getting tagged and it looked like, you know, his reaction time, it was going too fast for him. Kent Hughes said, if you're not used to going fast or if you are have a hard time ad adapting to how fast the game is, what would happen if you're in a car on the highway? and everyone's going fast. Do you get off on the service road to go slower? Because if you would, that would be like us taking you off and putting you in the American Hockey League. But if the American Hockey League is the service road, you're always going to get used to driving at 50 or 70. But you're still going to have a hard time adapting to the 100 kilometer limit and the only way you're going to get used to that 100 kilometer limit and some cars going a little faster is to be on the highway and be in the fast lane you might get into an accident at one point and you might dent the truck but you're going to learn or you might not but you're going to learn they thought Slavkovsky to get used to the speed of the game had to stay in the National Hockey League. One year later, I think we can all say they were right. Once again, as I told you, get used to more abbreviated editions of the Sick Podcast with Tony Marinaro. But the Sick Podcast with Tony Marinaro will be on every night. I want to thank Energy Transportation Group, a leading full-service logistics provider serving all of North America, driven to be different. I also want to thank La Bitta TB, brewed in Quebec, and a winner of a dozen international awards. La Bitta TB offers quality microbrewery beers made with premium ingredients for everyone's taste. La Bitta TB, embrace your true nature. By the way, don't go anywhere because in about a minute or two, I'm going to talk to you about what tomorrow's show is going to look like. Because yes, even though I'm usually not in on Friday nights, I will be in tomorrow on the Sick Podcast. Also want to thank Playground. 
You don't want to miss Night Fever live at Playground Thursday, April 25th at 8 p.m. Dance the night away and experience the magic of the Bee Gees music in a show that celebrates their timeless legacy. The show will take place under the Grand Marquis, a beautiful temporary structure that is perfect for electrifying events like this one. Playground, your entertainment destination. Visit playground.ca for tickets and Accent Insurance Solutions. All insurance isn't created equal. You know where to find the right solution for you. Accent Insurance. Accent doesn't sell insurance. They shop insurance for you to find the right product right on the money, whatever your insurance needs, home, automobile, or business. Tomorrow is a great event. It's an event called the Foundation Cup. And it's going to take place at the Bell Center. And following that, there's going to be a meal and a gathering over at a restaurant in downtown Montreal. I have asked to be a part of it. Several former Montreal Canadians will be a part of it. Several former NHLers will be a part of it. I'm going to bring Shane Gaumont with me. We're going to be a part of it. We're going to have some lives. We're going to have some shorts. We're going to have some interviews. We're going to have some conversations. We'll put together the podcast. And we'll bring it to you tomorrow. You don't want to miss this one. Stay tuned. Tell your friends about it. If you haven't followed us on YouTube, please subscribe. It's absolutely free. Thank you for watching on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Subscribe to our Facebook page. Subscribe to our Twitter handle as well. For Agnello Sammy at Master Control, they're Cavallaro. It's the Sick Podcast with me. Tony Marinero. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the Sick Podcast with Tony Marinero on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. The Sick Podcast is brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. La Vida TV. Embrace your true nature. And Playground. Your premier gaming destination.